Bulletin, we have all the, the different prayer meetings, uh, brothers and Bibles, as always on Tuesday, the women's Bible studies. Just go ahead and refer to the bulletin for the rest of the announcements. So with that said, here's Johnny. No, here's Pastor John. <laughs> oh my gosh, I've heard that my whole life. Oh, I've heard that my whole life. So turn with me to the book of James. We got to do a little pre-work. I got to move this before I get killed. That I tend to move around, so moving around with cords up here is a fantastic way for one to get for me to trip over, fall, and then get injured. So you know. So book of James. Let me go ahead. I should pray again before we begin, and just to give us some time there. We are in James three. Lord Jesus, we thank you for who you are, for what you've done for us at the cross. Lord, we thank you for your absolute sovereignty. There is not a moment in this world that you are not absolutely sovereign. There is not one hair on our heads that turns white or black to which you have not ordained. There is nothing, whether it's Ukraine, whether it's the U.S. economy, whether it's inflation, there is nothing that you are not in control over. Lord, you control everything. And Lord, we thank you and praise you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for our time together. And Lord, I thank you for our church. We can meet together and love you. And uh, we can worship you. It's in your good name. Amen. So I got to give a disclaimer before we get into this. Before we get into James 3. Because here's the thing. This is probably going to step on some toes because we are going to be talking about one of the most controversial things and probably one of the most convicting things and one of the most convicting body parts we have. Your tongue. Exactly, the tongue. Like, the tongue is... And we're going to be talking about the tongue in light of the gospel message of Jesus Christ. We must set that... Before we get into our text... We must understand that the tongue, what the things that we say, the words that we say, how we say them is a direct reflection of what we believe about the gospel. We, we've said numerous times that be, belief dictates behavior and behavior demonstrates belief. The scriptures have a lot to say about what we say and how we say it. Jesus says in Luke 6, 45, a good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good and the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So we're going to be talking about one of the most difficult things ever of taming your tongue, taming the things that we say, taming and making them and submitting them to where they're God honoring. So just giving that precursor before we get into this, because it's going to make us uncomfortable. But that's good, because that's for our good. Amen? So let's get into our text. As per our custom here at Berean, let's read the whole thing, and then we'll pick it apart momentarily. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with a with greater strictness for we all stumble in many ways and if someone does not stumble in what he says he is a perfect man also able to also to bridle his whole body if we put bits in the mouths of horses so that they obey us we guide we guide their whole bodies as well look at the ships also though they are so large they are driven by strong winds they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs so also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a word, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set amongst our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile, sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no, human, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness, made in the likeness of God. For the same mouth comes blessings and cursings. 
My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth the same opening, both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives? Or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. The word of the Lord. And the reason I do this every week, week in, week out, is there is something glorious about the public reading of Scripture. Because Scripture is... uh, Scripture is our, we we believe in something called sola scriptura here, which is scripture is the infallible rule of faith. It's the highest court of authority and it should be read, it should be preached, it should be proclaimed forever, everywhere. You never should take anyone's opinion for anything. Never take my opinion for anything. Look for it in the scriptures. Now, when we're talking about the tongue, James starts off this section with a group of people that use their tongues to communicate, teachers and hearers. He talks about teachers in verse 1 to 2. He says, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Right? I want to just get out of the gate real quick and say, this text scares me to death. Do you know why? I'm a pastor. Every week, week in and week out, I open the scriptures and preach the text and try to make, try to unpack and make that which is, that which is tightly packed here more simple and usable for the people of God. It is my joyous work and it scares me to death because you know what? I'm going to be accountable for everything I've ever taught, everything I've ever said. My judgment is going to be harsher and stricter because I should know better scares me. I, there's a story when I first came to faith that I got saved at a little Baptist church in over in Belleville. So when I was 17, I came to faith at 17 and God pressed on my heart a love for the scriptures. I love the Bible. I, I've love the Bible, read the Bible, learn the original languages, love everything about the Bible. Let me throw this out here. If you guys are at home and you're wondering whether you should watch something on Netflix or Hulu or something like that, or read your Bible, read your Bible. Trust me, that's the better option of everything you... I mean, we waste so much time on so much other needless nonsense when we have 66 books to learn to know. Brothers and sisters, swim in the Bible. Let the Bible mold you, shape you, know Scripture, love Scripture, memorize Scripture. I can't bang that drum loud enough because you know why? Because Scripture doesn't, we don't just don't read Scripture. Scripture reads us and then conforms us to the image of Christ. Now, when I first got saved, I had this love for Scripture, and it's the weirdest thing ever. So I got saved in an independent fundamentalist Baptist church. They're not fun kind of mental, but we love them. They put the hell back in hello. I mean, that's just how it works. So I had this love for scripture and I was 17, or I think I was 18, right? When I first came to, I came to faith at 17. The following year, they're like, hey, you know what you should do? Teach. You should teach. You seem to like the scriptures. You should do this. So over the college and careers, there was like three of us in there. I was leading a small group Bible study. I look back on that. You know what that does to me? horrifies me. I shouldn't have been anywhere near teaching. I should have been, I should have sat down, been quiet and learned. I was a year into the Christian faith. There was a lot, I shouldn't have been anywhere near teaching. And this text, I remember going through this text because I'm not the most creative person in the world. Actually, I'm not creative at all. Let me just be honest with you. You know why the la- since I've been here as pastor, you know, you know, the sermon series we've done, we went Nehemiah, Ephesians, James. You know why? The books of the Bible we've been going through, but Nehemiah, Ephesians, James. There's a- I don't do seven steps to a better you. I preach the text. I can't come up with cool, flashy titles and stuff like that. That's not me. I'm a preach the text guy. I'm not creative. So... <sighs> My thing is, when I got put in this role, I remember coming to this text and saying, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I, I'm starting to see something here. That guy's talking about me. I should learn before I teach. 
And I'll say this too, over my course of ministry, over through seminary, through pastoral ministries, through campus ministry, through every ministry I've ever, ever been in, especially in regards to the tongue, and I know this is probably true for most of you, my biggest regrets are from things that I have said. My biggest regrets, things that I've said, I've said with the wrong tone, found the wrong words, something I've said because I was angry, Things that I've said have become some of the most, uh, some of the things that have haunted me over the years. You know what I mean? You guys have ever been there, said something in anger, and then you regret it the moment it comes out of your mouth? That's why we should tame our tongues, brothers and sisters. Now, as we're looking into this, I want to say what this is not saying, first of all, before we get to what it's saying. This is not, just level with you too. Most of us are called to be teachers in some capacity. Most of us are called to be teachers in some capacity. If you're a parent, if you're a teacher, maybe a Sunday school teacher, maybe you lead a small group, maybe maybe some other aspect, uh, or a coach, or parents, aunts, uncles, you are called to be a teacher in some regards. Many of you are already teaching. Many of you are already teaching. So this text isn't saying that nobody should teach. We need teachers. We need people to step up. This is a plug here for nursery and things like that for the junior church. We need people to step up and teach. We will train you. We will help you. We will empower you to do that which, that which you would feel called to do. We won't just leave you hanging. You don't got to figure it out by yourself. But we do need teachers. We need teachers to teach children. We need teachers to for a variety of things. Eventually, we're going to be starting small groups. We need small group leaders. So think about that. We do need people to teach. This is not saying nobody should teach at all. But when you teach, uh, understand what you're fully getting yourself into. Right? James says here that not many of you should teach, my brothers, for you know when you teach, you're going to be judged with greater strictness. Before you get into something, you should know the consequences, right? It's like anyone ever bought a house or like signed an apartment lease or bought a car? Anyone ever done that? Or you signed a contract? You ever said the thing without reading it? And you're like, wait a minute, I didn't know I was supposed to do that. Yeah, you should learn all of the things that you're supposed to. You should know what you're getting yourself into before you start a project, right? Before, when you teach, understand that you're going to be judged more strictly. And that's okay. That's a good thing. That's something we should take on in some aspect. Now, what this text is saying, James is saying count the costs. Count the costs if you're going to be a teacher. Count them. Understand what you're getting yourself into. And I want to say this. For people, uh, if I can at all be pastoral here and be helpful with teaching. One, don't be eager for it. Although I know I just just contradicted everything I just said. Don't be eager for it. Let God call you to it. Let God call you to teaching if he's called you to teach. (sighs) Because nobody wants to sign up for a stricter judgment. Make sure it's from the Holy Spirit. Now, if you feel a direction, a desire to teach, pursue that. If you feel the Lord prompting you to uh, want to teach, pursue that. And while you're pursuing that, let other people confirm your giftings and callings. Just because you have a passion for something doesn't mean you're competent or called to do it. I want to make that clear and be pastoral here and, and be loving. One of the examples as I was looking through this and, and going through scripture this week was the qualifications of an elder. One of the qualifications of an elder, of a pastor, Timothy uses these in 1 Timothy to describe my job and the elder's jobs here. If, any man desi- if anyone desires the office of elder, he desires a good thing. The first qualification of an elder is to desire the work, right? You can't have the worst thing a church could possibly do is say just nominate people saying, yep, yeah, that's the elder right there. We should just throw, like, throw his name in the hat. No, this person should desire to be an elder. You should desire the work. Now, if you desire to teach, it's not just desire is the thing that gets you there. You got to be competent and you have to be trained, right? You have to be competent and you have to be able to, to do that which, uh, that which you're called to do. God doesn't call people who are unqualified. 
right? There's a very famous book by a man named Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Highly recommend it. Love Spurgeon. Wrote a book called Lectures to My Students, where he lies, he, 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 uh, he lays out advice for pastors. He tells pastors, he goes, this is back when, uh, back before microphones and stuff like that. I'm mic'd up right now. I got a microphone sitting on me. They didn't have that. One of the things Spurgeon said, he's like, hey, if you can't project your voice, like if you, if you have a very, very quiet voice, you're probably not, in that time period, you were probably not called to preach because you didn't possess the abilities to do it. You have to look at certain things and giftings and abilities and other people around you call those out. Other people around you assess those things, not with just your desire. I'll give you an example here. I'm six foot tall, right? I'm six feet tall, slightly round, slightly round. Now, if I looked at you and said, guys, check this out. I feel called to be an NBA player. Check this out. I am called to be an NBA player. You're like, bro, no, no, you're in your 30s. There's no way that's going on. There's no way you're going to get fast enough, lose enough weight, and grow by six inches. That's not going to happen. You're 35. I mean, you break, you, I fall up there, I'm going to break a hip, and I'm going to be done. I'm going to be done for. Things don't heal quite as great as they used to after, like, age 30. I'm just, I'm just saying. I, I, after age 30, I mean, you could sleep wrong and hurt yourself. I've never hurt myself sleeping. Yes, I have. Everyone's hurt themselves sleeping. You just wake up. Oh, my gosh. What'd you do, run a marathon? No, I took a nap. <laughs> but that's the thing. God empowers. Uh, like, if I were to say to you, hey, I want to be an NBA star. You're like, no, you don't have the giftings for that. Same thing goes with the qualifications of an elder and with a teacher. If someone looks at me and says, hey, Pastor John, I feel called to be an elder, and their life is jacked up, guess what they're not called to be at the moment right now? An elder. Like, if you can't teach and you're, you're, your family's a mess, your finances are a mess, and you don't, you don't meet all the qualifications, you're not called at this time. That's just how it works. The same thing with teachers. So, if you feel a desire to teach, pursue that. Let other people confirm that calling in your life so that they might be able to help and direct you. Now, when they help and direct you, you need to get the training. That means if you're going to be a teacher, first thing before you become a teacher is you need to become a good student. If you're going to be a teacher, you need to be a good student. What does this mean? It means you've got to read books. It means you got to listen to lectures. It means you got to take in information. That might mean, like, especially if you want to be a Bible teacher or a pastor or something like that one day, man, uh, you might go to seminary. You might go to seminary and learn things and get uh, education and things like that. Take classes. Like, we should train the called instead of calling the trained. Like, once we've confirmed calling on someone, then we begin their training. Does that make sense? What I'm trying to flesh out here, like I look at my story, and I don't want this to be about me, but I'm just using myself as an example here. When I first felt a call to ministry, I vividly remember going to my elders and saying, brothers, I feel called to do this. What do you guys think? And they're like, you know what, John? Yeah, you got some natural aptitude. We could possibly see you doing this. Go. Go. Go, go get training. This is a good idea. So I had pastors write letters of recommendation before I started seminary, before I started pursuing the education, before I started spending money and building a tower and all the other stuff. I had people confirming that call. So calling, then training. Does that make sense? You guys tracking along with me? Now, I want to ask the question here of why a stricter judgment? Why are teachers put on a stricter judgment here? There's a twofold principle. One, knowing. Two, living. So you want to know the subject and you want to live the teaching. Teachers should be informed about what they're saying. And if they're not, they shouldn't be teaching. You teach what you know. If you don't know, you shouldn't be teaching. I mean, I hate to state the obvious here. But also, with living, they should, their lives should demonstrate what they are teaching. And in fact, they're not hypocrites. They want their lives to reflect their teaching. 
I want to break this down first, part of the knowing the subject. Right? Let's look at the knowing portion. And a few things about this. One, confidence in a subject does not equal proficiency in the subject. Confidence in what you're saying does not equal proficiency in what you're saying. This at this is important, guys, because this is important. People say things confidently all the time. And just because someone says something confidently doesn't mean what they're saying is accurate. Right? This has, this has, this has implications on information intake, what we hear from other people, and information delivery as to what we say to other people. Let me break this down. So be careful when you pay attention to someone and making sure they know what they talk, make sure you know what they're talking about or make sure they know what they're talking about. So how, you, how do you do this? One, you ask questions and look for consistency. People, brothers and sisters, use big words to hide their own ignorance. This is true. People use big words to hide their own ignorance sometimes. If someone's proficient in something, like theology, for example. I love theology. I love reading big, thick, glorious books. I have a library in my house. It's glorious. I lock myself down there some days. It's just my little place away. I read old dead guys. Read old guys. Read old dead guys. Old dead guys are never going to change their theology. They're never going to have problems. They're never going to blow it. They're already dead. They can't. They're with Jesus. Read old stuff. Old stuff's the best stuff. But here's the thing. A lot of times when you use, read big, thick books, you run into words that are very term specific, like hermeneutics, um, um, exegesis, um, all of these words that are very term specific. If somebody's using a term that you don't understand, make them define it. I feel like, wait a minute, I don't fully understand what the word photosynthesis means. Could you help me out with that one? It's supposed to be funny. Like, or you find a, word, a big word that somebody's using or they're using it in, incorrectly. It's like the princess bride where the guy's looking over saying, you're using that word. I don't think it means what you think it means. Like, make them define it. Make them define their words. Uh, the surest sign someone doesn't know what they're talking about is that they're inconsistent. If you're listening to a teacher that is completely inconsistent, guess what? There's a problem. Now, the other thing, too, when looking at this with teachers, don't just take credibility indicators for granted. Don't just take credibility indicators for granted that someone knows what they're talking about. Credibility indicators, for those of you who don't know, are those things in society that people pick up, right? Like degrees, for an example. Like, I'll give you an example here. It is possible to know all there is to know about medicine, right, apart from going to medical school, correct? Right? Makes sense? You could read books and do all the other stuff and not go to medical school and learn about medicine. Are you going to let anyone cut on you that doesn't have an MD after their name? Say you need a surgery or something like that. You're like, hey, my brother-in-law knows what he's talking about with medicine. He's read a whole bunch of big, thick books. He's like, hey, he's got a pocket knife. He's going to do your surgery for you. I'm not doing that. That's crazy. But here's the other thing. Like, w certain credibility indicators are important, but sometimes just because somebody has a fancy degree after their name doesn't mean they know what they're talking about. Some people go to university, some people go to college and universities and get a degree in confusion. It's the truth. You see people coming out of college sometimes and they don't know what they're talking about. Sometimes very educated people say very dumb things. So just because someone has a degree doesn't mean what they're saying is accurate. Now, I want to, uh, us to see that because sometimes we put our, our trust in people and we ought not to. We ought not to. Now, for information delivery, how we deliver information. So we know what to look for when other people give it to us. Now, what, what about for us? This is a caution, brothers and sisters. Be careful that you don't come across as knowing more than you do. Be careful you don't come across as knowing more than you do. Sometimes we inadvertently do this. So we want to be honest where we're at, where we're shortcomings, and where our shortcomings are. I'll give you a human example. I'll give you a human example of this. I know someone personally that sounds like they know what they're talking about with most subjects. They sound like an expert, and if you're not versed in what they're talking about, 
it sounds great until you start asking questions. It sounds wonderful. And you're like, wait a minute, buddy. That doesn't, and they're an expert on everything. This person's an expert on everything. From cooking, to gourmet cooking, to auto mechanics, to uh, f- the floral industry and how flowers should be arranged. I'm like, you have never done that in your entire life. You have no idea what you're talking about. There's a biblical example of this too. False teachers do this. In 1 Timothy 1, 6-8, certain people by swerving from these things, have wandered into vain discussions, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things which they make confident assertions about. Brothers and sisters, people sometimes get zealous for things they don't fully understand. Sometimes people get zealous for things they just found last week and then try to bind the consciences of other people that, hey, I just figured this out, but this is for you as well, too. This happens all the time with young men. All the time with young men. You find something theological, or this is awesome, I just found this out. Everyone else, like, I've seen guys, and this is a God's honest truth, I have seen guys embrace a theological position and then the theological position that they just came from, that they just believed 14.32 seconds ago, that guy's an idiot. Dude, you were standing there like four seconds, like like 14 seconds ago. You know you're talking about you? You just found this out? Chill, chill. Like, I see this all the time where people get theolo- like a little bit of theological training or a little bit of theological stuff in their brain and they want to make a binding on everybody. Like, it could be anything. It could be your view of soteriology, your view over music, your view over anything. I, my recommendation is to find things out, move slow, and then don't move again, right? Learn and then don't move. I see this happen all the time with young men. Now, Let's be careful, brothers and sisters, that when we're listening to teachers, we want to make sure that confidence is just, even if someone's confident, we want to make sure that they're accurate. Now, I want to say this too to be pastoral for people that want to be teachers. One, you don't need to know everything to be a teacher. You should know what you're teaching, right? You need to know enough to teach, but you don't need to know everything there is to know about a subject. Be honest about the things you don't know and be honest about your shortcomings. So if you're sitting there and you're like, wait a minute, I don't know everything. That means I can't teach anything. No, teach what you know. Teach what you know. You have something to give to someone else. You have important things to give to someone else. I know one of the... I talk about my spirit. I talk about my five foot six giant all the time. My granddad, I just love him to death. He barely could write his name, right? That man was packed more full of wisdom than anyone I've ever met on the face of the planet. And I remember telling Papa, "You have so much stuff to teach. Like you, this is awesome." He's like, "I don't know what I'm doing." I was like, "You do. You've been there for like ninety million years. You know exactly what you're doing. Like you know, like." His wisdom and stuff, he had stuff to teach, but he didn't think he had much to teach. He didn't know he was, he was a giant. I stood head and shoulders over that man, but he was, the gi- he was a giant in my life. Uh, sometimes people get freaked out, and they ought not to. Sometimes the right answer is, I don't know. Sometimes the right answer, uh, there was a, I was listening to, Elliot Grudem, Wayne Grudem's son, tell a story one time about his ordination council. Basically, if you're a pastor, they they bring you in, they grill you on theology. And there was a guy that came in there. He's a real brilliant theologian. His name's John Frame. He sat down and he he was sitting with these people and he's grilling them over theology. Imagine getting grilled by a big name guy like John Piper or John MacArthur, one of those guys. John Frame's one of those guys. He's grilling him. I'd be nervous. I'd be terrified. He goes, he stopped the guy. He goes, that's the best answer I've ever heard. That's the absolute best answer I've ever heard. You know what the answer to the question was? I don't know. Sometimes the honest answer, the honest answer is always the best answer. Even your best teachers don't know everything. 
I don't know everything. My professors in seminary didn't know everything. Nobody knows everything but God. We should be humble and teachable. We should be humble about our knowledge and be teachable. Now, let's look at this with living because this is important. Because you should know, a, a teacher should know what they're talking about and they should live what they're talking about. In verse two, for we all stumble in many ways and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, also able to bridle his whole body. This is, James is getting at here that he's walking the walk as well as talking the talk. Like, his words are not being contradicted by his actions. The life of a teacher should reflect the teachings that they they profess to know. Remember, guys, belief, belief dictates behavior. Behavior demonstrates belief right? You, you're, I believe that this stage when I got up here was going to hold me. I behaved in a way that demonstrated by actually walking up here that that, that was true. It's, it's standing. It's uh, like, it works. It's not, it's, it's still holding. I, my behavior demonstrated my belief. Now, this has extreme importance when it comes to teaching because teachers can undermine their messages by their behavior. Right? I'll give you a secular example. You ever, you ever went to the doctor? Like you go for your like yearly health checkup every year. And they take your blood and all the other stuff. They give you the lecture. They give me the lecture every year. They're like, hey, you should chill out. You should lose some weight. You should do all the, the, the all these things you should do. Right? You ever had that where you go in there like I'm dreading it? Cause, or like you go to the dentist like you should floss more. When's the last time you did that? Well, you did it last time. Like, <laughs> like. Like that, you get lectured about stuff. Is that lecture easier to take from someone that's, say, like, ripped? Like, they say the health thing. Like, hey, you should lay off the Big Macs and French fries. And the guy's, like, ripped, right? Comes in there, just, like, healthy looking. Or the guy that's 750 pounds overweight saying, you should lay off the Big Macs while he's chomping on one. Scenario one is easier to take. Because you're living the truth which you're professing to believe. This happens, unfortunately, in Christianity all the time, where big-name guys bring reproach of the gospel, bring reproach because of their bad behavior. I keep a list of guys, this this is sad, because I keep a list of guys that were amazingly influential to me in my what not to do folder. I use them as negative examples where men that were influential on me and then were destroyed by either personal sin, they were destroyed by their own greed, their own lust. I'm thinking about, um, like, I'll give you an example because it's public knowledge, like Ravi Zacharias. That man had got investigated by his ministry and then came out that he was doing crazy things in Malaysia and all kinds of things like that. It came out. Like, what do we do with that? Well, his behavior wasn't the behavior that he professed to believe. Like this, this we, don't, we want to live as if any moment of our life we're going to be seeing Jesus. We want to live. 1 Timothy 4, 6 says this. Keep a watch on your life. Keep a watch. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this. For by doing so, you will save both yourselves, yourself and your hearers. It's both. It's both and. It's a lifestyle and it's the words which we profess and the lifestyle in which we live. Amen? Amen. This is also important too. Now that I've said that, even the best teachers are not going to live their beliefs perfectly. However, we want to live exemplary, right? None of us are perfect, but we should live exemplary lives. None of us are perfect. It's like the story with Jesus, with the woman caught in adultery, right? He that is without sin casts the first stone. Everyone drops them because no one's without sin, right? Everyone in here, self-included, is a sinner, right? Like if I followed you around with a clipboard last week and just, you know, checked it off. So I got my clipboard, I'm walking around, I'm following you. I could could check off some sins that you committed, right? You could do the same for me. Like... None of us are going to be perfect, but we want to live exemplary lives. Like the, the qualifications that I mentioned earlier of the example of the elder. 
The first quality of an elder, according to 1 Timothy 3, 2, is therefore an overseer must be above reproach. Above reproach is a junk drawer category that says, you need to be the Teflon man. Pastors need to be Teflon men. That nothing sticks to them, that things that, you, there's no charge you could levy. Be like, there's no glaring open like sin in this man's life. We want to make sure that that's the, that's the thing we're striving for. We want to strive to demonstrate we believe uh, the gospel. But here's the thing. Even though uh, there's no glaring moral defect, this text doesn't say the man is not a sinner. Brothers and sisters, I'm a sinner. Your elders are sinners. Your deacons are sinners. At our best, we're just sheep. Even though we're sh- some of us are shepherds, at our best, we're still just sheep. Pointing to the great shepherd We're broken sinners needing a Savior. All the Christian life is one of repentance. All the Christian life is one of repentance. So when we sin, we repent and we follow Jesus and we seek to live holy lives. Amen? Now, even though some of us are not perfect, we should be exemplary. So in the rest of our text, we see James talking about being exemplary with our language. Let's look in 3 to 12. He says, For if we put bits in the mouths of horses, so also they obey us. We guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the the ships as though they are so large and are driven by straight winds, driven by strong winds. They are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts in great things. How great a fire is set ablaze by such a small fire. A forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. The tongue is a fire and is a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among members and stained the whole body. James here gives us uh, three different analogies, which we're going to look at here in a moment. But I want to say something before we get into that. What type of thing is James talking about when he instructs believers to tame their tongue? Let's ask the question. What type of thing is he saying here? We need to bridle our tongues. He gives us the three different examples here. What is he talking about? Because it's very important here to what... what be what we're told. Taming the tongue is mastery over what you say, no matter what emotional circumstances you fall, you befall you. Does that make sense? Taming of the tongue is mastery over what you say, no matter the emotional circumstances, so that it's God honoring. Amen? Amen. Now, why do I say this? Why do I say it's the emotional circumstances? One, James talks later in this text about cursing our brothers. I've never, like, if, when people are getting cursed at, it's usually when there's emotions involved. People are usually angry, right? Like, if somebody gets cursed at, like road rage or something like that, it's usually because emotions are involved. Now, I have to say this about emotions and language. And I need to address this because this is important, especially with language. Emotions affect language. You know the reason why people say things when they're angry that they normally wouldn't say? Because the the angry emotion overrides their brain to where they no longer care about the consequences, right? People get so angry sometimes that they no longer care what's about to happen. Because the emotion overrides the other portion of their brain that says, that's not a good idea. Now, what we ought to do is not let our anger or our emotions get the better of us. I have seen this with someone to where they have been so angry. Like, I'm illustrating this point here. They've been so angry, like, and you call them to repentance and you're like, I don't care. People will say that. You ever seen that? People get so mad they say, I don't care. This shows that anger has an impact on righteousness and behavior. Now, all of that to say, like, we need to be able to control our emotions and control our anger in light of the gospel. Amen? Now, let's look at these analogies. The three analogies that he uses. He uses, the, he uses two for mastery and one for misery. Two for mastery, one for misery. The bit, the rudder, and the flame. The bit, the rudder, and the flame. Let's look at the mastery ones first. This is benefit if we can, if we can control our tongues and we can master our tongues. There's some benefits here. So let's look at the first one, the bit. What's a bit used for? 
bits get put into horses' mouths so you can steer them. Horses are big animals. My granddad had some horses. They're big animals. They're, they're large animals, and you put a small bit in its mouth to make it go whichever way you want to when you steer on the reins. Same thing goes with the tongue. If, we can, if horses can be led around by their mouth, so too, can we, so too should we lead around our own tongues. So too we should lead around our own tongues. The rudder. What is a rudder used for? Rudders are a small thing in the back of a ship. Have you guys ever been on a boat? Like boats, maybe like, I mean, we, we live in Michigan, so there's lakes everywhere. There's lakes everywhere, everywhere. I live in a city that's known for its lake, Belleville. So ships get steered around by a little rudder. What is this illustration pointing to with the tongue? The tongues are really small. The tongue is really small in comparison to the body, just as a rudder is really small in comparison to the ship. It steers it around. People can be steered off or on course with their tongue. People can be steered on or off course with their tongue. One commentator said this about this passage. The illustration is equally striking and obvious. A ship is a large object and it seems to be unmanageable by its vastness. And it is also impelled by driving storms. Yet it is easily managed by a small rudder. And he that has control of that the control of the ship itself, so with the tongue. It is a small member in comparison to the body. In its size, not unlike the rudder, as compared to the ship, yet the proper control of the tongue in respect to its influence on the whole man is not unlike the control of the rudder on the power of the ship. Your tongue and your words, brothers and sisters, steer you. They demonstrate your belief. They steer your, where you're going. We need to control those things, amen? We need to master our tongues like the rudder of a ship. We need to master our tongues like the, like the bit we put in a horse's mouth. We ought not to spaz and foam at the mouth when we're angry, amen? In light of the gospel message of Jesus Christ, who lived the life we couldn't lead, died the death we deserve to die. This affects our language and how we, how we live. Now let's look with the misery. So those are mastery, the bit, the rudder. What about the misery of the fire? How great a forest fire is set ablaze by, how great a forest is set ablaze by such a fire. And the tongue is a fire in a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set amongst the members, straining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life and set on fire by hell. Note, he's not talking about just a small cook fire. This is like a forest fire. You guys ever see the things in California where, I, I remember seeing pictures of California where people are driving around and the whole hill is on fire. Like everything is burning. I remember seeing people with ash just covering everything, their whole, like their whole possessions and stuff, like a volcano going off. It's like that. A small fire can be destroy everything. So here's some examples of what your words can can destroy. Your words can destroy your relationships. Your words can destroy your ma friendships, marriages, acquaintances. The wrong words, the wrong tone can destroy those. Your words can destroy your testimony with Christ. Imagine you're at work with a friend or something like that and you start spazzing and foaming at the mouth. Good luck sharing the gospel because it's going to be harder. Your behavior doesn't demonstrate your belief. I remember my mom talking about one of her co-workers when she worked in the marketplace. The man was studying to be a pastor. And he had such a problem with his tongue, she, she started questioning his profession of faith. We don't want to be that guy. We want to be the guy we, that, that our words match our behavior so that, we see, so that people see Christ in us. Amen? Your words can destroy your credibility. Here's the thing about credibility and trust, guys. Credibility takes a long time to, to build like a skyscraper. You guys ever seen skyscrapers? That take, I, I worked in Detroit for, for a couple of years, and I remember looking down there building buildings. It was awesome. Just see steel girders and concrete and all kinds of cool stuff. That takes a long time. You know how long it takes to destroy one of the bad boys? Just like that. Yep, just like that. They, they, set, they set charges, demolished the whole thing. I remember the Hudson building 20 years ago where they publicized it on TV. I remember being a little kid. Like, we're going to demolish the Hudson building. And they 
blew the thing up and it caved in on itself. It took them probably years to build that thing. It took them like four seconds to blow it up. Same thing with your credibility. Your credibility with your words can, you can destroy your own credibility in about three seconds. It takes you, tw- it takes you a long time to build, but you can destroy it rather quickly. What I'm not saying, guys, I'm not one of those guys that's the, the word, words have power and like what the charismatics do. I'm not, the, don't hear what I just said like that. I'm not the whole name it and claim it, blab it and grab it, your words speak your future. No, 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 not that. I am saying, though, that your words demonstrate the gospel that you believe, and your words can destroy that. Your profession of faith can, des- can destroy that with your words. Now, in our last little section in 9 to 12, let your beliefs about the gospel guide your language. Let your beliefs about the gospel guide your language. I want to walk through this text. James makes a statement in verse 9. He says, with it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the image and likeness of God. From the same mouth comes blessings and cursings. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. He's telling them that let their life demonstrate the gospel that they believe. Their word should demonstrate. And he's telling them currently it doesn't because you can't curse, you can't curse your brother and then bless God in the same breath. You can't. You can't do that. It doesn't work that way. Like, he uses uh, analogies and he shows how contradictory this is in 11. Does a spring bring forth the same opening, both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or grapevine produce figs? No, a tree is known by its fruit. You are known by the fruit that you produce, brother or sister, in light of the gospel. Your words, your actions, your testimony demonstrate the gospel that you believe. You should tame your tongue. If you have a problem with anger or you get angry real easily and you start, ha, freaking out, foaming at the mouth, you need to get that under control. Why? Because Jesus, because it's in light of the gospel, Jesus saved you. Scripture says be angry and do not sin. Be angry and do not sin. Don't let your own words destroy your testimony. Don't let, like, fig trees produce figs. Christians produce righteousness because God has changed who we are and what we've done because of the gospel of Jesus Christ who came as second member of the Trinity in the likeness of sinful man was stretched out on a cross in our place and for our sins and we repent and believe this gospel. This gospel has drastic implications on the words that we say, on the tongue that we have. This gospel changes everything. This gospel can change your life. This gospel gives you new life, new words, new family, new everything. It's this gospel that we love and proclaim. And if you're here today, let today be the day of salvation. We should pray, brothers and sisters. Lord Jesus, you're gracious, glorious, kind, and wonderful. Lord, I pray for, for us that we would, that our tongues that our tongues would be consistent with our beliefs, Lord, that our tongues, that we would, li- that our belief would dictate our behavior, and Lord, our behavior would demonstrate our beliefs. Lord, I pray that we would, uh, that we would love you, that we would worship you, we would follow you with our words, our thoughts, our actions, and our deeds. It's in your good name, Lord. Amen.